In the past, we have covered many ancient anomalies, out-of-place artifacts, and unexplainable features, all hinting at an ancient high technology which ancient man once possessed. An ability to create tremendous heat and thus advanced metallurgy, and in some cases, seemingly turning stone to magma, a knowledge and technology which at some point within history became lost. One upart in particular is the slab of Beit Sharim, an enormous glass slab dated at many thousands of years old. Yet to have created such an enormous piece of ancient glass would have taken incredible heat in an incredibly large furnace. Coincidentally, all sharing an inexplicable similarity with the collection of artifacts which are the focus of this video. Discovered in 2019 on Melbourne Beach, off the coast of Florida, a total of seven artifacts, including the ancient Peruvian death mask, were found. After detailed analysis, the composition of metals used in the manufacture of the artifacts have baffled scientists. Created using copper, gold, and silver, yet what stunned those investigating the items was the presence of iridium. Not only is iridium incredibly rare on Earth, with most found within meteorites, but its melting point is also yet another mystery. For as how the Inca apparently created them, if indeed the Inca were responsible in the first place, is yet to be explained. Dated at over 12,000 years ago, some of the artifacts clearly depict known Incan gods, one of which being Viracocha. Whether these beliefs were merely adopted, like the many unexplainable ruins we regularly cover, and claim were merely re-inhabited is unknown. Yet what we do know is that the melting point of iridium, 2446 degrees Celsius, thus any artifact dated to these tremendous ages, yet created with such tremendous temperatures, furnaces and metallurgies claimed as undiscovered during or prior to their claimed eras or ages of construction, mean that they simply shouldn't exist. Yet they do. The question is how? How did the Inca acquire such rare elements? How did they manage to accomplish such temperatures and work the metals at such an early age within known history? We find their possible true origins highly compelling. In the first wing of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, close to the Room of the Mummies, one cannot help but be surprised by what you will discover. In a small, inconspicuous display cabinet, an object like no other can be found. Made from a brittle stone known as schist, it is similar in shape to a wheel or discus. This mysterious and to this day unexplained item has become known among particular circles as the tri-lobed disc. It has perplexed all those who have examined it, especially the select Egyptologists that have had the opportunity to study it at great length. Its discoverer is known as one of the most important Egyptologists of the 20th century, author of a classic volume on Egyptology, Archaic Egypt, that continues to be an important bibliographic reference of study even to this day. While carrying out excavations in 1936 within the archaeological zone of Saqqara, Emery discovered the tomb of Prince Sabu. Among several utensils of varying function, the trilobe disc would be found. Emery's attention was immediately drawn to the object, initially defining it in his reports on the First Dynasty tombs as, quote, a container in the form of schist bowl. Years later, he again commented on the subject with a word that perfectly summarized the reality of the situation, indicating to the discomfort the object was causing, describing it as a kachibachi, a small hole that threatens to become bigger and bigger. It seems Emery, like many others within the same field, retained their success and notoriety by deliberately and publicly denying such artifacts any traction within the public domain. 
denying us all a true understanding of Egyptian history, or at least a questioning of the currently upheld teachings. He finished his quotation by stating that, a satisfactory explanation has not yet been obtained on the particular design of this object, or indeed its construction. The accepted and predictably rigid view regarding the introduction of the wheel into ancient Egypt coincided with the invasion of the Hyksos at the end of the Medium Empire in 1640 BC, this date being over a thousand years after the disk's construction. Egyptologist Cyril Alred reached the conclusion that the object was, without a doubt, a copy of a previously much older metallic object. A detail next to the orifice in the center also made him suspect that this object was only a small part of a more complex mechanism and that it was saved thanks to a stone reproduction for unknown reasons made by an artist with unknown tools, and the fact that it demonstrates such a complex design at such a primitive time in ancient Egyptian history suggests its origins may have been far more unusual than modern tenants would have you believe. It is highly possible that this artifact is a fragment of one's highly advanced technologies, which have subsequently been lost over the millennia. Regardless of hypothesis, its true function, history, or indeed construction, its reason for existence remains a mystery to this day. When they land and the hatch opens, perhaps we will be looking at ourselves in the mirror. Many of you will be aware of the interstellar traveler, which visited our solar system from a galaxy far, far away a few years ago. Named Oumuamua, it is now recognized as the first known interstellar object ever successfully detected as it passed through our solar system. Formally designated 1-2017-U1, it was discovered on the 19th of October 2017 by Robert Work while using the Pan-STARRS telescope at the Haleakala Observatory within Hawaii. He spotted the mysterious object 40 days post-solar transit on the 9th of September that year. Many people have wondered about the true origins and indeed true identity of the object, yet few have received the backlash which Avi Loeb experienced on November of 2018 when he published a new research paper in an astrophysics journal. Scientists publish thousands of research papers every year. These papers will often attract little public attention. However, Loeb's latest work gained a suspiciously high level of controversy and rejection when he dared to cover the rather taboo subject within this so-called official field, aliens. The subject of the paper was the mysterious supposed space rock. He posits that it likely traveled for billions of years, past countless other stars before reaching our own. Eventually, it will cross the edge of our solar system and into interstellar space again. The leading hypothesis among astronomers is that Oumuamua is an odd-looking comet, a remnant of another solar system kicked out by natural forces and sent barreling through the cosmos. Loeb, however, offered a rather different explanation. Quote, Oumuamua could be a probe one deliberately sent to our solar system by an alien civilization. The detection of extraterrestrial beings, the most significant scientific discovery in human history, if we were ever told about such discoveries, of course, one must remember that as a civilization, many believe systems openly objective to the possibility of alien life, many of which are over a millennial old. The thought of finding sapient life beyond Earth, of learning that we are not alone, however, is the pursuit of countless individuals within the modern world, so it is no surprise that his opinions have been so widely debated. But additionally, there is seemingly another possible reason for why the paper was so widely reported on, this being the fact that Loeb is, in fact, a tenured Harvard professor within the astronomical department. Quote, if this was some random astronomer that you had never heard of from, say, Equatorial Guinea, you probably wouldn't write a story on it," says Brian Gensler, the director of the University of Toronto's Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics and a former colleague of Loeb's at Harvard. He continued, There's a lot of astronomers that have outlandish ideas, and most of them aren't taken seriously by the community, 
and most of the time the media don't really give attention to them." End quote. Loeb has two decades worth of experience and is well regarded in the field. So, regardless of what others would like him to believe, his opinions matter. Was Oumuamua really an ancient alien's exploratory craft, one spying on ours and many other solar systems? If it is, it means we are indeed not alone. What's more, it means we have undoubtedly been found. So, the professor's opinions, no matter how controversial, we find highly compelling. Elongated skulls have been unearthed in many places on Earth, linked to ancient cultures globally. To this day, artificial practices of accomplishing this striking deformation can be witnessed among remote tribes in certain parts of the world. Thanks to this, and indeed the remains that have been found and studied previously, we not only now understand how this elongation is artificially accomplished, but also anomalies found on some specific and rather special specimens. For example, if one exhumes the remains of the ancient civilization of the Han culture, one is able to establish many things regarding the past technique. The individual skull which endured said practice. This can often be done by tracking the cranial napping found upon all human skulls. However, what makes others so intriguing, for example the Paracas skulls or the lost believed stolen skulls of Malta, this napping that one would expect to see is either absent or, if present, not of a deformed nature, suggesting that the previous owners of these craniums had this naturally from birth, leading to many hypothesizing that they were either a now lost subspecies or possibly an ancient alien visitor. If we track the provenance of these beings, one can also argue this increased cranial mass as a possible contributing factor in increased intelligence. Many of the ancient pharaohs of Egypt exhibit this, and indeed the skulls found at the ruins in Malta with its astonishing acoustic properties. Their burials evidence of them once being valued members of these societies, but also the possible contributors to the advancements in technology and architecture found at these sites. The most unusual, however, those with no evidence of binding, have been found at many prehistoric sites, such as the so-called alien mines along the banks of Lake Superior. Lloyd Pye has also made a lucrative business promoting the discovery of a curious humanoid skull he found a few years ago. Although not dismissed as a deformity, many still strongly believe it to be that of a human-alien hybrid. Regardless of the artificial binding which still occurs, questions remain. Why do some of these skulls appear to have been natural? Why is the ancient practice undertaken? Who inspired it? Why were the exquisite skulls of Malta stolen? Are we really looking at the remains of ancient alien visitors? It is an area of historical research which we find very intriguing. President Putin recently visited one of the most mysterious places on Earth, the ruins of the ancient town of Archim. Historians, archaeologists, and UFOologists have spent many years trying to unravel the secrets of this place. Which nation was living in Archim more than 40 centuries ago? How did people of such ancient civilization manage to accomplish the incredible technological progress on Earth there? The Archim Valley was supposed to be flooded in 1987. Local authorities were intending to create a water reservoir there to irrigate drought-prone agriculture. However, scientists found strange ancient circles in the center of the valley. Authorities gave archaeologists 12 months to explore the area. Scientists were shocked at what they discovered. However, it is not the unusual earthworks that have attracted investigators, but rather, what was recently discovered beneath. A discovery which has seen several renowned alien investigators rushing to this remote and forgotten slice of the Russian landscape in search of the undeniable proof that we are not alone. Researcher Maria Makarova and her team were able to unearth a remarkably well-preserved skeleton in the ground beneath the site. 
However, it soon became evident that this was no normal skeleton. And although the research team have attempted to disagree with the clear possibility of it not actually being human remains, choosing to suspect that the skeleton somehow belonged to a woman from the Sarmati tribe, which lived in what is now Ukraine, southern Russia, and Kazakhstan about 2,000 years ago. It unfortunately appears that this is an attempt to discredit the real possible value of these remains. This being a logical move by all professional researchers funded by an academia, which would not appreciate such honest and clearly forgivable assumptions based on current evidence being publicly disclosed. For example, firstly, the Sarmatia tribe may have practiced head binding. However, this practice is largely believed to have been located in other parts of the world, and the lack of any additional finds within the tribe supporting this assumption would seem this is a deceptive conclusion to arrive at. Additionally, when head binding was undertaken, unmistakable evidence of such is left upon the skull. Deformed cranial napping, the stitching of the skull will not appear as normal, yet, alas, the stitching will always be present and easily identifiable. Though astonishingly, this skull clearly shows no evidence of binding on the photographs. What's more, and perhaps more pressing, is the lack of any cranial stitching visible whatsoever. This stitching of the skull plates is part of human growth. We all have them, yet this skeleton does not. What do you think regarding the find? An abnormal tribe member buried beneath an extremely ancient, mysterious site? Or something else entirely?